gonna share screen with you right now, as always. Okay, there you go. Um, tonight, we're gonna talk about Tabernacle, as we said. And uh, our theme tonight, we're going to focus on, uh, on our lesson. Uh, we're gonna focus on this, that the Lord reveals himself as a God who saves his people in order that he might dwell in their midst, which is in this world and in the world to come. So this, is sen this sentence alone is very amazing, okay? Very amazing. Now, you can read it one more time. I'm going to read it one more time. I'm going to let you have a, a digest of what is said over here. It says, the Lord reveals himself. Okay, he, He's going to tell us about himself, make us known, uh, sorry, make himself known because he is a creator, we are the creature. Unless he reveals himself to us, we would not know him as perfectly as he would love us to do it. So the Lord reveals himself as a God who do what? Who saves his people. Oh, he reveals himself, but when he reveals himself, it's not just to tell us how strong he is or how different he is from us, but that he wants to save his people. Okay, out of the creation, he wants to save his people. Why? Save his people to do what? Save his people so that, uh, you know, he, he, he fulfilled his duty? No. In order that he might dwell in their midst. In order that he might be resident with us in this world that he has created or in the world to come. Okay, that is very amazing because usually in any religions, in any religious uh, worldview, worldview, you will see that um, the gods or the god they do not want to have any uh, share any sacred space with human beings simply because uh, the divine and the human are from different uh, plane or from different world or from different uh, dimension. You want to put it that way, okay? So even in uh, uh, in uh, in Islam, okay, the God uh, or he, he, that. People who have, uh, okay, so people who have their good works way outweighs their bad, their bad works, their bad things, uh, they will be put by the side of God, not with God. It's by the side of God, which means to say that, you know, in a way, you, can, you, can, you, you don't see that God would share space with human beings. Uh, but there, here in the Bible, this is a very radical thing. It's a very radical thing. Only in the only in the history of redemption, only in the in the God of the Bible, you see that God would want to dwell in the midst of His creation. Okay, so that is very important that we're going to start today's lesson. All right. Now let's look at the, the verse for today. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. John chapter one verse fourteen. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, let's read it one more time. It says, the word, the eternal word, became flesh, human flesh, and made his dwelling or his tabernacle among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, it's the word of God, and let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has come from eternity into our world to save us, to reveal himself, his glory, that we can see, that human beings are able to see and perceive that glory. And that glory which come that is from eternity, that you have come to show us that you are saving us and you want to dwell among us. Lord, such great mystery. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit tonight, illumine our mind from the word of God and show us your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now uh, the descriptions of the tabernacle. Okay, um, the word is skinny in, he, uh, in Greek, skinny, okay? Um, just now the word you saw, dwelling, the word there is skinny, uh, skino, skino. Skino means 
tabernacle, or you can read in such a way that the word became flesh and made his tabernacle, or the word became flesh and tabernacle among us. Okay, now this is very interesting because the description of tabernacle immediately come called, you know, was called into view. Okay, that uh, we, this word tabernacle, it may seem very foreign to us, most of us, unfamiliar to most of us. Because of that, many people tempted to skim over all the tedious detail uh, describing the tabernacle, especially when you read Exodus chapter 25. You know, in the beginning of the year, you read, you know, you determined to read the Bible, right? So you finally finished with uh, Genesis. Okay, you brave through Genesis and then you finish the story. And then now you come to Exodus. In the beginning part, wow, it's very epic, right? A lot, very, a lot of things that are happening. Um, the ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then uh, the, 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 the Sinai, you know, the giving of uh, the law and all that. And then suddenly you come to Exodus 25. You thought the laws is already done, you know, done with the law. And suddenly you see tabernacle and all the details that are being given in the tabernacle. And then most people at this point of time is the time that they would surrender. Huh? They would just, you know, um, scheme over, you know. But that is a mistake. Okay, that's a mistake. Now, why I want you to know that God has provided us with this very graphic, very vivid, very clear picture that is full of rich theology from the tabernacle okay even in the construction of it this is another world so when we are pausing if we are able to pause and take a closer look at all these these bible passages that talks about the tabernacle it will open up a window for us to see a very delightful very fulfilling truth that christians today must receive and in fact should rejoice over it so rather than seemingly seem to be like mundane, you know, you will discover exciting displays of the glory. And in fact, that glory that comes from the gospel truth can be seen from the tabernacle. You say gospel. Hey, I thought it's only Jesus that brings the gospel. How can tabernacle? Yes, including the tabernacle itself. And I don't mean the tabernacle prayer. If you have made that prayer before, I'm not talking about that. Okay, um, what is tabernacle prayer? <laughs> Some of you may be asking. Tabernacle prayer is just a prayer that once in the 90s, in the uh, late 90s, uh, was quite popular, that people would want to uh, try to imagine that they are entering into the tabernacle. In a way, there are some theology is being taught there, but not very rich, not very, not very deep. It is more of like, uh, you know, to help people to get into the mood of prayer. Uh, instead of uh, the very basic ACTS, okay, uh, adoration, confession, uh, uh, thanksgiving, and uh, supplication, you know, that four steps. But yeah, so that was the thing. But anyway, today we want to look at this lesson and we're going to ask questions like this, okay? What is the main point that God intends to teach us through the tabernacle? And how is that related to the Bible as a whole? I mean, look at the tabernacle. You know, the, all these details. How is it that this is connecting the dot with Jesus? Was Moses given a role in the design of the tabernacle? What it was his role? And what theology, what do we know about God that we derive from the components of the tabernacle? And what theology do we learn from the order and the sequence? You know, you notice that there's a sequence, there's a certain order that a priest would follow in their service inside the tabernacle. And what is there any theology there? Is there anything that teaches us about God? And how did the tabernacle point forward to the New Testament and beyond? So these are the questions that we would want to survey tonight. Right? Now, um, I think by now you will know the drill. We ask all these questions because we want uh, to attempt to look into each of them from today's lesson. I want to introduce to you a 17th century Dutch theologian. Her name, his name is Herman Wichius. Um, he said something very interesting. Um, he said God created the whole world in six days, but he used 40 days to instruct Moses about the tabernacle. A little over one chapter was needed to describe the structure of the world. You know, you need about one chapter and plus a little bit to talk about the structure of the world. But for tabernacle, 
you know, in the Bible, it uses six chapters to just talk about the construct of the tabernacle. So this is very interesting because nearly half of the book of Exodus is not about the actual event of Exodus. Nearly half of it is, you know, is devoted to describe the design and the construction of the tabernacle from Exodus 25 to chapter 40. Right? Now, why is this so? Well, because the Lord reveals himself as the God who saves his people that he might dwell in their midst in this world and in the world to come. So I'm just repeating what I just said you know, in the beginning about the theme of the lesson today, right? So why? Because God reveals himself as a God who would save the people, as a redeemer. Why? So that he redeemed his people so that he can dwell in the midst of them. So the tabernacle teaches us something very important about our life with God. Our life with God. So we study the tabernacle to understand the steps that the Lord has appointed for a sinful people. How should we approach a holy God now that we are redeemed? Now that we are being redeemed, how should we approach the holy God? So what we glean over here, what we learn here, will be traced throughout the remainder of the, re of the Bible. All right? Now, in order to understand the theology of the Bible, you must first grasp what God has revealed in the unfolding of this portion of the redemptive history, in particular, in or through the tabernacle. So I'll say one more time. Huh? So this is the time when you look at the tabernacle, you need to understand what God is revealing about his redemptive history, his history of redemption. And then you will understand, you know, what is the Bible trying to teach us about God? So the first thing, the first thing is about the tabernacle, about God dwelling in the midst of his people is this, that God's dwelling is with his people. We need to look at God dwelling in the midst of his people because this is the main point, the main theme in this section about the tabernacle. So once again, what is the tabernacle about? The main thing about the tabernacle is this, that God wants to dwell in the midst of his people. All right? Now, recall from the second lesson that we had, you know, we talk about Genesis. We talk about the creation. We saw in the very beginning of Genesis, God dwells with Adam, right? He walked with him in the cool of the day. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And then in lesson three, we talk about the fall. We saw that man was driven out of Eden. Man was being cast out, out of God's presence. But God also gave promises that he would reconcile himself to his people, right? We saw that. Um, how? Remember, anyone remember? Genesis chapter three, verse 15, right? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, right? So, crush already, then how? Crush already, that means, there's, that means the seed of the woman is going to be, you know, from God, okay? So, there will be a reconciliation. So, we have watched the covenant promise also that's been unfolded, and we talk about this covenant of grace, and by now, you should heard me talk about the word covenant for, you know, for 150 times already, right? Um, assuring us that God will dwell with his people, the covenant again and again, you remember the promises. When we talk about covenant, we have the promises, the blessings for the obedience, right? And what is that? That God will be their God and they will be my people and God will dwell with them, right? So now at Sinai, at Mount Sinai, which last week we have looked a little bit about it, that God provides further revelation about his purpose to dwell in the midst of his people. Why does he want to dwell in the midst of his people? And he reveals the way in which this must be brought to pass. All right? So the tabernacle was the Lord's temporary dwelling place during the wilderness. You know that they will be going into the wilderness, right? Uh, God led them out of Egypt through crossing the Red Sea. The Red Sea, if you want to be more accurate, right? Yamsuf. Um, the tabernacle was the Lord's temporary dwelling place while they were still traveling as, uh, as, a, as a people in the wilderness. 
So we're going to look at a few things. Now, the tabernacle was called the tent. The word tabernacle means tent. Okay? But it is a special tent set apart from all others. Okay? And because of that, the tabernacle is called the tent of the Lord. The tent of the Lord. Ohel Adonai. Or the tent of meeting. Okay? The tent of meeting or the tent of assembly. Alright? So, it's a tent for assembling. It's a tent for congregation. So, the Hebrew word is ohel moed. Moed means assembly or congregation. Alright? Ohel is the tent, the camp. Right? Now, um, the second name for it um, is also known as the sanctuary. The sanctuary. It was also called the sanctuary. Okay? Mikdash. Because it was the place of God's holy presence. Why is it called sanctuary? Sanctuary basically is like a special place. You know, when we talk about the bird sanctuary, that means it's a place to keep all the birds there. Okay? For them to freely roam around, freely fly about in the sanctuary, in a safe, protected area. So sanctuary also means a holy place or good because God's holy presence is there. And then the third name that also points to the same thing is called the tent of the testimony. It is also called the tent of the testimony. Okay? Or hell ha edut. Um, or in literally, it means the tent of the covenantal law, the covenant law. Now, the two tablets of the law, remember last week we talked about it, right? The two tablets, there's the first tablet and the second tablet. The two tablets of the law were also called the testimony, the testimony or witness, the testimony. And they were also placed inside the Ark of the Covenant with the Holy of Holies. Later, we're going to look at the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? It's not the Ark of Noah, it's not the Noah's Ark, but this Ark means um, it's, it's actually like a square, like a box, okay? Um, is placed in this compartment or this segment of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And so it testifies to God's covenant of grace. Remember the word covenant, right? So far, we only see, yes, it's been, you know, God made his covenant with Abraham, with Moses, but in essence, these covenants are actually one same covenant, right? It's just, at, it's just called Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, just because it is being renewed at different times to different people, uh, to a specific people. That's why it is called like that. But actually, the content is actually the same. One same unified theme for everybody. Now, the tabernacle, which you can see, the tabernacle was used in the picture. Uh, the tabernacle was used from the time of Exodus until the time of King Solomon. Now, until the time of King Solomon, because at that time, they were already a dynasty, right? So the tabernacle was already being replaced by the temple, by the temple. Now, if, if you look at the picture alone, uh, these are illustrations, you can see that it is much more, much, much more um, elaborated in the temple, all right? Much, much more elaborated, okay? Compared to the tabernacle, which, is, which looks a bit more primitive, more, uh, sim much simpler, Right? Now, the tabernacle was located at the dead center, very, very center of the Israelites' camp. Of the Israelites' camp. Okay? And um, there are 12 tribes that camp around it. Right, let me see if I can find a picture. Ah, okay, so this is how it looks like. All right? So you can see that this is the, the tabernacle. And then the rest are all the camps, the tents of the Israelites' people. And to, to put it in a, in a, in a landscape uh, way, uh, this is how it looks like, okay? All right, so the tabernacle is there. Um, sorry, jumps. Okay, the tabernacle is there. Then you see um, the formation of it or the encampment. God's appointed arrangement. And it is, it, of course, what does it show? It shows very clearly, if you look at the picture alone, huh? it shows very clearly that God is dwelling in the midst of the people, isn't it? Right? It's like if this is the if this res represents the whole of um, uh, Israel or the camps of Israel, okay, then the epicenter, you know, it's like a hot spot of the Wi-Fi, the hot spot of it is where it's in the middle, it's a tabernacle, isn't it? Right? So this clearly states 
especially towards the beginning of this section of the scripture, which in, we read in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary. Uh, remember the word sanctuary just now, huh? Makadash, Makadash, um, for me, and I will dwell among them, or I will dwell in the midst of them. All right? Now, this message of God dwelling among his people, you know, is connected to the heart of what? I will dwell among them. What is this? What kind of language is this? Anyone remember? I will dwell among with my people. This is connected to what? Anyone? This phrase alone. I'm going to live with them. I'm going to dwell with them. They will be my people. I will be their God. What kind of language is this? I'll be your God and you'll be my people and I will dwell among you. What language is this? Anyone? Okay, let me see. Is it Justin? Who's that? Ah, covenant, correct. Okay, this is the language of the covenant. All right, so when you look at this, you hear these kind of words. Huh? Please, your ear must go up already. Okay, your radar must go up and uh, tell yourself or make a note there. Hey, this is the covenantal language. Okay, there are many things that I've given you so far. Remember, you see the word curse, you see the word blessing, uh, you see the word promise, you see generations, you see land. Okay, you see uh, now this, I will be, you'll be my people, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, and I will dwell with you. These are all covenantal language. It's about the covenant. Nothing else, it was about the covenant, right? So you almost can see nothing new. Nothing is actually new. It is only spoken to who, right? Now, and then you look at Exodus 29, verse 45 to verse 46. He says, then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. See that once again? The same formula. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I, may, I might dwell among them. And I am the Lord. I am Yahweh their God. Right? So the purpose of the tabernacle was to continue the Sinai experience of Yahweh. On, out, on, on Mount Sinai, you saw that Yahweh appear in a theophany. Right? And uh, the experience, and you also see uh, uh, when Moses brought them out of Egypt, where did they go? They go to Sinai. They return to the same place. And what would they do there? They worship God, right? And then God uh, reenacted the covenant promises to his people, right? And then give them the law, which is the Ten Commandments. And so we see that this is a continuation of the Sinai experience of Yahweh dwelling in the midst of Israel. And why do we say that? We see the parallel. We notice the parallel. Especially we read in Sinai, at Sinai, Exodus 24, 15 to 16, you read, it says, when Moses went up to the mountain, on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. All right? So we see similar language with the tabernacle. In, for example, Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Now not Sinai, but the tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Do you see this? Do you see this? So you, did you see the parallel there? So the experience of God in the midst of his people at Sinai. At Sinai, it was on a mountain. It was on a fixed place. It was on a fixed location. But with the tabernacle, it is as though that the Sinai is now on mobile, <laughs> on mobile mode. You know, it travels with the people. And so every time they come back to tabernacle, they are brought back to the memory, to that place, to the same place of Sinai. And I, are you seeing what I'm seeing, right? So this is where we see God in the midst, dwelling in the midst of his people, will be perpetuated, will be brought like a mobile Sinai in the tabernacle, okay, in the form of the tabernacle. Now, that was the first one. That number one, what is the tabernacle teaching about? It's about God dwelling with his people. And why does God want to dwell with his people? What language is this? The covenantal language. The covenant of, the covenant of grace. Second aspect that we're going to see is that there is gospel in the tabernacle. The gospel that is in the tabernacle. We need to recognize there is a gospel pattern and the gospel content that is found in the tabernacle. 
in the tabernacle, we see certain pattern about the good news, about the gospel, that God is going to redeem his people, reveal himself as that redeemer. And God is going to tell this content through the tabernacle. And this is actually the gist or the meat or the crux of the message for tonight. Okay, And this is where we will spend most of our time today, tonight. Um, before we look at all the details, you know, as you can see some of the labels over there, notice that there is a kind of divine prescription. There's a divine prescription. Now, we saw Abel, we saw with Abel and Cain, uh, Abel, uh, that God must only be worshipped in a certain way. What certain way? That is according to his own prescribed prescription. Who can worship God? Or what kind of worship is acceptable to God? The kind that God has prescribed that man should worship. It's not any kind. It's not with any offering that you want to bring, you also can off offer to God. No. There's only a certain kind. And this was further ratified, this was further confirmed again in the second commandment where God speaks to us in the Ten Commandments. He said, what, what is the second commandment? The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth below or in the waters, sorry, or on the, on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You cannot make any graven image, you cannot make any carved image for yourself in the form of anything. So God is saying, what does it mean? That means you can only worship me as I have said I should, that should be worshipped. You cannot say, I want to make this to represent God. So that when I see this thing already, then I remember God. No, God says no. When God says no, it's very important. Because he's trying to say that you cannot determine what kind of way you want to worship me. I am God. You can only hear what I say that you can worship me in what way. Okay? And this is again repeated and repeated and again and again elsewhere in connection with the moral law. With the moral law. And we talked about the moral law yeah, last week. So those of you who missed out last week, go back to listen to the YouTube uh, last week, the lessons last week about the moral law and the three categories of the law. Moral law, judicial law, and uh, ceremonial law. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, 12, we have those words that God says, see that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. So this biblical law of worship, this biblical principle of worship applies to all men, all human beings throughout all the ages. So we cannot add, we cannot subtract from the acts of worship that God has specifically appoints for his people even though what he specifies may differ, and it does differ in the Old Testament from the New Testament. We shall see. Okay? In the New Testament, there are some modifications, but it's only determined by what he himself wanted it to be. We cannot simply just uh, do whatever we want. The tabernacle, not surprisingly, was constructed according to the pattern that were commanded by God, not by Moses. It was not Moses who instructed them how to build the tabernacle. It was not Moses' brilliant idea because he stayed too long in Egypt, uh, in the, in the, in the um, uh, palace of Pharaoh. Uh, so he came up with a brilliant idea of how to construct a kind of building uh, that looks like uh, the palace of Egypt. No, it was not. It was God's idea. So Moses had no role whatsoever. All right? So we answered that question that we asked in the early on. What kind of role does Moses play? Moses has no role at all. And in those chapters, when we look at Exodus 25, all the way, stretching from Exodus 25 to Leviticus chapter 7, which you must persevere, right? If you're studying the Bible, you must persevere from these chapters onwards, all right? You will see that God supplied every single detail, not Moses, so that it will all be erected, it will all be built exactly as how God has commanded it. And we will see, if you go turn your Bible, you flip your Bible to Exodus chapter 31, you will see like verse 30, 11, it says like, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place, they are to make them as just as I commanded you. You see, the language is always woven. Uh, it's always mentioned uh, all throughout. Nothing is allowed to man's imagination. 
You cannot use your own imagination, your creativity, your innovation, whatever you may call it, to create something for the tabernacle. No way. No way. They are to do it strictly as how God has said. So all kinds of human innovation, creativity, you know, um, modification are strictly prohibited in God's worship. It's not like today, you know. Uh, today, we see all kinds of worship style, you know. Uh, if you like this music, uh, you use this music. If you like this method, you use this method. If you don't like this, you can take away. If you feel that uh, this is uh, uh, distracting, uh, you can take away. These are all modern day human beings, innovation and their own imagination, which is actually to God, you know, is a great insult to God because who are you to change the way how he has prescribed for you to worship him, right? But what exactly did God describe in this pattern? Well, this brings us to consider the theological content. We look at the pattern, we need to ask what is the significance. And so we're going to look back at the individual parts of the tabernacle, okay? It may sound very, they are very technical, so I'm going to put up a lot of pictures for you to see so that it's more graphical for you, okay? And we're going to look at, just don't look at the, the, the architecture alone, but look at the content. Okay, you might probably want to have a pen with you or a pencil with you and write this down, okay? Now, the provision and the arrangement of the various components and pieces of the furniture actually reveal God's gospel grace. We will see God's grace being revealed in the way in which he redeems sinners or sinners who have been redeemed can actually have an access to the holy God. So if I made a, if I have created, if I have committed a crime, if I am committed sin, what should I do? Is that a way or not to, to, to come to God? Yes. And that way is through what we can see through the patterns of the tabernacle. And this is very important. We'll consider each of this furniture, each piece of this, in, in the order that a priest would come in and encounter. What would they, what would they see first? Okay, so with that, we will trace the theological theme and the redemptive content that God has revealed. And both the sequence that the priests follow, as well as the individual piece of the furniture, actually each of them, all of them, they convey gospel truth. And this is what we are going to look at. Okay, we're going to look at. Okay, so any question for now?